your source for everything paranormal, Parapex. Throughout the ages, history has been altered by word of mouth and the misrepresentation of those who might not have been present when some of the world's most significant events took place. Channelers Barry and Connie Strom bring through the spirits of those who actually witnessed or took part in these historical events and lets them tell their stories in their own words. Welcome to Channeling History, and now, here are your hosts, Barry and Connie Strong. Welcome, everybody, to Channeling History. Uh, by now, you should know that we're the only show where we speak to the souls that made things happen in the past. And we're brought to you every Sunday night on the Para-X Radio Network. I'm Barry Strong, and I'm your host, and I'll be doing the channeling tonight. And I'm your co-host, Connie Strom. I'll be asking the questions of our spirit guest tonight. Tonight, we will be speaking with the spirit of the famous escape artist and magician, Harry Houdini. His abilities to escape from the most complicated and difficult environments, including jumping into the frozen East River in chains, thrilled thousands of fans. He's agreed to speak with us tonight. This is a great honor in that he has not been with any other psychics. Okay, next week, we're going to try something a little bit different. We're going to be channeling three guests for a roundtable discussion. And the subject is going to be the growth of evil in our world and how to stop it. The guests for this roundtable are going to be John Maynard Keynes, a famous economist, Bishop Fulton Sheen, and Albert Schweitzer. Now, there are three big names, and we're going to just have an open discussion with them next week. I think it's going to be very important because as we find economic conditions harming many around the world and evil policies by many of the governments, it's going to be very interesting to see what these three great minds have to say. Now, we never know in advance what our spirit guests are going to say, so it's always prudent to include a disclaimer. The opinions or statements voiced on our show are the channeled words of the spirits and do not necessarily reflect our opinions those of the Para-X Network, or of our sponsors. All of our shows are available on our YouTube channel in Barry Strong's name. Or if you'd like to download them, just go to Podomatic.com and just search Channeling History. We're currently doing podcasts named A Weekly Message from Jesus and Eternity Speaks, in which we bring a message of faith and inspiration to help guide us through the current troubled times. We post the new messages from from our Lord on Wednesdays, and we channel the Holy Spirits on Sunday mornings, and they're also available on our YouTube channel. And we would like to thank all of you that take the time to listen to our show every week and to join us even in the chat room. Your questions are always appreciated. Please tell your friends about us so we can continue to grow our audience and get our education out there. Okay, before we channel, we always say a prayer of protection. Prayer was given to us by the spirit guides when we first began to communicate with the other side. So, Connie, let's say the prayer, and we'll begin to channel with Harry Houdini. God, please grant us your wisdom and protection. Grant us the knowledge that we can handle and keep us safe from all things that will harm us. Keep the messages positive and pure love. Keep us safe from our egos. We ask these things in the light of the seen, the unseen, and the honesty of God. Okay, Connie, uh, I've been looking forward to this. We talked uh, with Mr. Houdini in the past, and he was wonderful, very informative. Uh, I know tonight's going to be very interesting, so let's begin. Okay, let's start out. My manners put in place. Uh, how would you like me to refer to you, sir? Uh, Harry's fine. You can do it first name, or if you feel like it, just use Houdini. Just, there's another lot of bad names you could use, but let's just go with those. Okay. We'll go with Harry for now. Would you like to begin with a message? Yes, I would. When I was first asked several years ago to speak with Barry and Connie, I didn't want to do it. Throughout my life, I had run into many, many so-called psychics or spiritualists there were actually fakes trying to take money from people. I hadn't heard of you folks 
and I thought you were just like, like the others. When Jesus came to me and asked to go on the show, I, I realized something was very different. And I'm very happy that I did appear with you a couple of years ago. I thank you for many of the kind words that you said about me, and all the questions were very fair. And I would like the people to pay attention to this. It is an absolute fact that Barry has a very unique supernatural ability to speak our words. I wish that I would known about him after I passed so that I could have gotten a message to my wife, but that it's not necessarily anymore since she's with me on this side. So thank you. I'm anxious to try to answer your questions. So why don't we begin? Okay. Uh, how do our listeners know that we really are speaking with the spirit of Houdini? That's a very interesting question. I know that I, in life, planted a lot of seeds to believe that all psychics were fake. So it's only natural that there's going to be many people come forward that aren't going to believe that you're really speaking with my spirit tonight. I'm going to answer many questions that you're going to ask. I know that Barry would be incapable of answering some of these questions because I'm the only one that knows a bunch of the answers. When you're dealing with the supernatural, there are so many fakes out there. Especially with social media, there are many folks that are claiming to do things that they really aren't doing. I know that it's very difficult for you to try to truly believe what you're hearing is the truth. I can assure you that it is. I suggest that you listen to the questions in their entirety, hear my answers, and hopefully you will be convinced. Okay, as you said, we did channel you several years ago. And after that, uh, we had a lot of emails calling us fakes and liars. What would you tell those people? Once again, that's a very difficult question because I spent much of my time calling psychics fakes and liars. I would tell them that this is truly different. You have been doing this show now for almost two years, and you've been talking to many, many different spirits. It would be literally impossible for you to have the world of knowledge that would have been required to answer all of those questions for two years of all the different spirits. I would also suggest that if they have doubts that they listen to your other two podcasts. I can assure you that, that Jesus really does exist. I didn't see him before he came to me to ask me to come here or to come for the last show. But I've seen him, I've talked with him, and yes, he is very, very real. I know that he comes to Barry and Connie on a regular basis. I know that he brings messages, and I know the other great leaders have as well. I've talked to Muhammad on this side, and he has told me that he's also coming to them with messages. Look at the entirety of their work. I think that there, if you do that with an open mind, there's no way that you th can think that these people are fakes. Harry, have you ever attempted to contact any other psychics? I, there are a lot of fakes out there, but there are also, are also other ones that are sincere. Yes, there are those that are sincere. I also do not want to try to contact my wife and have psychics use it as a, a way of enriching themselves. Part of what I like about talking to the two of you is that you don't charge for anything that you do. I think that that is a true indication of love of what of your work. I, I never met anyone that I truly trusted that were psychics. I felt that it was just simply much safer not to come forward and basically keep my mouth shut from this side. 
Okay, I know you said that you wanted, would like to have uh, contacted your wife after you passed. How did you attempt to contact her? I tried to come to her in her dreams. I tried, I tried different things. My guides tried to, tried to give me suggestions. I didn't want to try to work with any of the spiritualists or psychics for reasons that I just discussed. I could not get through to her on my own. Once I was on this side, I realized that my wife did not have any true psychic abilities. I think that she did see me in, in her dreams, but she didn't realize what I was trying to do. I did not know any psychic that I could trust, so obviously I was not able to contact her. Okay, we've got some questions here that you've already answered because you're so good. So let's start with now with where were you born? I was born in Hungary. My parents immigrated to the United States at a very early age. It was a time of, of mass migration. The United States offered great opportunity. Europe basically was in places still in the Middle Ages. We came, we came to, to this great country, and we tried to make, my parents did the best they could to make a living. It was, it was a time that quite often immigrants were looked down upon. So we did change our name. It was a time, well, Jewish people were always looked, are always seemed to be abused and looked down upon. So we felt that we should change our name and assume identities that would let us prosper in the United States. Why did you decide to become an escape artist and magician? Times were very tough. I didn't want to work on a farm for the rest of my life. Vaudeville was very exciting. It was the way that people were entertained in those days. Keep in mind that in the early 1900s, they still didn't go to the movies. They certainly didn't have television or the internet. But they could go to vaudeville shows and they could enjoy themselves. There were some great people in vaudeville. Many of them were funny. People traveled around the country and appeared in small groups and small theaters. I, I always had an appreciation for magic tricks. I had certain physical abilities that I realized could help me do certain types of escapes. I tried, I tried reading cards, didn't do real well at that. Once I started trying to escape from handcuffs and from chains, people started to pay attention. Vaudeville was fun. I loved being with the people, and I loved being in front of the people. I guess maybe I was a little narcissistic. I loved the attention. I studied hard about magic I studied in the techniques of escaping from different types of chains or handcuffs or different situations. I kept myself in top physical condition. I taught myself to hold my breath. I taught myself how to control my breathing. I did many things that were required to truly excel at being an escape artist. Vaudeville was the big thing. You could make some money at it, you could pay your bills, and you could have a good time. In life, did you have any supernatural abilities? I didn't realize that I did, but there were times that I would be coming exhausted in my stunts or possibly even close to being to dying. I would hear voices would come to me, and they would 
give me advice and they would say you have to do this i would have i would have very vivid and lucid dreams sometimes i would i would see my family members in my dreams i guess i didn't totally realize that that was having a having a type of psychic ability i never i never really talked about it i didn't want people to think that i was using psychic abilities in my stunts I just wanted them to think that I was doing it on my own. How did you come up with the name Houdini? I realized that my European and Jewish name was not going to work well in vaudeville. I wanted people to think of me as a as a magician. I wanted them to have a name that they could remember. There was a great was a magician that I studied under, Houdin. I thought that his name would be, would be something that would be possible to use. My brother was with me. He tried to give me some assistance in, in naming. And finally, we came up with the name Houdini. In life... What were your beliefs in God? I think that I always truly did believe in God. Sometimes I had doubts about him. I did not believe in religions. I thought that many religions were not teaching, were not doing what they should be doing, were not trying to assist people. There were things in the Gospels that I had trouble believing. God is a very difficult concept. But when you, become, when you come close to God, like I did in multiple occasions, you realize that, uh, that there are energies out there. It was, I guess it was not truly until I came to the other side that I had a full understanding. Yeah. In life... What was your opinion of the afterlife? I was unsure. I knew that there were many fakes out there that were talking about communicating with the afterlife. I could prove that they were fakes. I think that if I would have truly run into somebody that I understood was a great, was had the true abilities, that I would have had a different opinion. I know that I always hoped there was an afterlife. I know that my wife thought there was. She never had doubts. I guess, as in most things in my life, I always had, I had a lot of doubts about them. So, what did you think when you arrived on the other side? I was utterly shocked. When, I, when my spirit passed from my body... All of a sudden, I was surrounded by deceased family members, friends. There were even some very famous people there to meet me. I realized right away what was taking place. I couldn't, I couldn't really comprehend everything, the, the beauty of the place, the colors. It is, it is a truly magnificent, place. It's so hard to describe. I'm sitting here trying to describe it now and my spirit cannot come up with anything. It's just as all of your guests have said before heaven is not something you can describe. It's something you have to it's something you have to, have to experience and everyone will experience it. So this might be a difficult question but how does it differ from what you thought it would be in life? I thought of the afterlife more like the presence of ghosts. I felt that there were ghosts, that there were spirits, but how, um, for instance, uh, an oil painting being haunted would represent or have a spirit attachment would represent the afterlife that many people spoke of. There were 
there were many things that I couldn't understand. I thought that I understood some of it, but you only truly understand when your soul passes from your body. That is what we've heard. I have a question from one of our listeners. Are there any escape artists today that impress you? There are some very talented magicians that are out there today. David Copperfield is an incredible magician. And in certain ways, I guess you could consider him an escape artist. He is probably the most talented person I know of. I don't, and I don't recommend that people take some of the chances that I did. Much of what I did, uh, people could call insane. And it did almost cost me my life several times. Modern technologies are allowing people to do things that we could never have considered in my time. I would think that David is probably the person that would be at the top of the pinnacle for me. Uh, from many of the escape escapes that you performed, it almost appears that you had a death wish. Did you fear death? I didn't fear death. It was kind of weird. I didn't want I didn't want to die. I wanted to be able to pursue my profession. I had met the woman that I loved. There were many things that I wanted to live for. Yet there was part of me that 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 drove me to doing these often insane acts that would bring me very close to to finding out if the afterlife was real. No, I don't think that I really feared it. I, I figured that there was something out there after death, didn't know what it was. But no, I think I didn't, I, I really didn't fear it. What was your most dangerous stunt? I did quite a few that were really quite dangerous. I think the stupidest one I ever tried was being buried under six foot of dirt. The weight of the ground upon me was much heavier than I ever anticipated. The, I think that the, the soil was moist, and that made it more difficult. I fought to dig my way to the surface. I just barely broke through before I gave out. I was actually unconscious when they pulled me from the from the ground. I truly believe that that was one of the times that there was intervention from the other side. I really had no right to to live through that stunt. It was too dangerous and it was very stupid of me to even try it. Generally, I could control all of the variables and some of the the very difficult things that I did. But that ground was just much heavier than I ever conceived of. Tell us about the stunt where you dove into the frozen East River in New York. Yeah, that was another crazy one I shouldn't have done. It almost got me. The shock of hitting the water, and I was in chains. So I had to, first I had to focus on escaping. The water was freezing. It was a relatively small hole that I dove through, and I totally miscalculated the current of the East River. I fought as hard as I could to, to escape from the chains, which I did, but I was further away from the hole than I ever imagined I would be. I swam as hard as I could, and I could, I could see the light, and I just barely broke through before I would have had to I went before I would have run out of oxygen and drowned. It was another very stupid thing, and I know now that, that God was watching out for me in this, but it was once again a time of intervention from the other side. There were voices in my head saying, you can make it, you can make it, don't stop. It was... Uh, it's certainly not something I would recommend that anyone else tries. 
So you were a challenge to your guides. What did you do to prepare for diving into the East River? I would I would sit in tubs of ice water. I would practice holding my breath. I would try I tried to be at my best physical condition for it. It was I did everything that I thought I could do. I thought that I understood the currents. I tried to do some analysis of the river, but believe me, the reality of what was taking place when I hit the surface of that water far exceeded anything that I had trained for. Why did you push yourself to do such dangerous stunts? I think that's a really good question. I'm not sure I have the answer for you. There was always something inside of me that wanted to make me the best. I had accomplished much. I had thousands and thousands of fans around the world. I guess it was simply me trying to please my fans and trying to be as popular as possible. I was one of the highest paid performers of my time. Every time that I would push the limit, it would do good things for me financially. I had, I had, I guess I had quite an ego. I wanted to push myself to be the best. And in doing that, I took many, many chances I should not have taken. So what did your wife think when you did the really dangerous stunts? My wife supported me. She assisted me in my shows. She understood a lot of the risks. She would ask me not to do some of the things, but I would tell her that I had that it was something I had to do. She would tell me that it was something that or that I sh- I should not do. We always knew that death was an absolute possibility in my business. I told her that I would attempt to contact her. She tried for 10 years to make contact with me, and I could never get through. I was very well blessed with my wife. She was a magnificent person, very supportive, would help me with some of the technical ideas that I needed to make my act work. But yes, there were times that she would ask me not to not to do something, and my ego would get in the way and I would try. Well, she sounds like a wonderful lady. Could you tell us a little more about her and things that she did? She was just a wonderful person. She was truly the love of my life. When I met her, I knew that I'd met my soulmate. We're together over here, and we're still as much in love on this side as we were on that side. When you have somebody that supports you like that, then you can you can often work miracles. Did you ever have a near-death experience? I was never I was never in the in the tunnel. I never really saw the light. My near near death experiences were basically voices telling me to keep going. They were telling me it was not my time. You can do this. I would consider that a near death experience. There's many different types of them and I can guarantee you that I was near death enough times to know. So you had divine intervention several times in your, during your lifetime. I guess you could call it that. I'm going to, I guess the divine intervention pushed me to the point that I did not give in to those terrible situations that I had put myself into. It Divine intervention is very difficult to describe. As you all know, you come back with a life plan. If situations are taking place, they're guiding you away from that life plan and are attempting to end your life prematurely, 
your guides will often step in or your angels and they will try to do things to prevent you from having a premature death. I think that's what, well, I know that's what was taking place in some of my stunts. There is no doubt that I had help from the other side when I was buried in that dirt. The fact that I got my hand to the surface before I collapsed, in my mind, was a true, was a true miracle and could not have been accomplished without supernatural assistance. I understand all that now. Uh, I guess you could call a lot of the things that took place in my life a uh, near-death experience. All right, let's take a small break here. We'll be back in a bit, and we'll be on get on with this very interesting show. Don't go away. Channeling History will return right after these brief messages. In order for the light to shine so brightly, the darkness must be present. Tune in every Monday at 10 o'clock. The Dark Sun Rising on the Para-X Radio Network. Hi, this is Marla Brooks from Stir in the Cauldron. Thursdays are a great night on the Para-X Radio Network. We start off the evening with Journey into the Light, Chapter 3, with your hosts, Psychic Little T and Tabby Cat Gash at 7 p.m. Eastern. Then, on the first and third Thursdays of the month at 8 p.m., it's Tango and Friends, hosted by Bruce Tango. And on the alternate Thursdays at 8 p.m., tune in to Stirring the Cauldron, the Archive podcast. Every week at 9 p.m. Eastern, join me on Stirring the Cauldron Live. And then at 10 p.m., stick around for New Aeon Now with Lily Alley, Davron Michaels, and Christine Matza. Finally, to round out the night, join Dr. Kelly Renee Schutz on the Paranormal Encounters podcast. All this, every Thursday, right here on Para-X. Have you ever wondered what Jesus and his followers would say if you could receive their messages today? In his new book, Spirits Speak, Channeling Jesus and the Holy Spirits, channeler and author Barry Strom answers those questions for you. Using his gift of spirit communication, he brings you messages from such Holy Spirits as Moses, John the Baptist, Mary Magdalene, Mother Mary, Jesus, and even Mother Teresa and the Reverend Billy Graham. They discuss topics that are important for contemporary life in these troubled times. Spirits Speak, Channeling Jesus and the Holy Spirits is available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and other booksellers. Signed copies are available on the author's website, spiritspredict.com. After reading this book, you will never again say, what would Jesus say or do? Welcome back to Channeling History. Now, here are your hosts, Barry and Connie Strom. Okay, welcome back, everybody. Uh, I'm enjoying this show a lot. Uh, I think we've got some really good questions coming up. So, Connie, let's go. Terry, how long could you hold your breath? I reached the point that I could hold my breath for over three minutes. I I know I wish I could have held it longer at times, but uh, that was the best I could do. The stunt that probably gets the most interest is having a full-grown elephant disappear. How did you make the elephant disappear? I'm very reluctant to answer this question for you. Uh, Magicians are not supposed to give away their secrets. There were many, many years that nobody had any idea how this act, act took place. I know that there are people that have discussed this, so I guess it's not as much of a secret as it used to be. We were doing a show in a very, very large space. I had built a large box. It was large enough to hold the elephant, and it was much larger than people realized. We had doors on the end that you could look through it. We had some mirrors 
that would help. We had the elephant enter the box. We closed the box up. We let the people look in to see the elephant. I mean, I am simplifying this a bit. The box was long, was larger than people realized. So once we closed the box up, we had a secret door and we had the trainer go into the box with the elephant. He moved the elephant to the side of the box and we had a heavy black curtain that dropped over the side of the elephant. When we opened the door, you could see through because it was the elephant was to the side of the line of vision. The elephant never left the box. It only looked like it did. We turned the box. We had men turning the, the box on a... It, 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 was, it was made that you could rotate it on the ground. They turned the box, and whenever you looked into it, with the way we had things set up, you could see the light on the other end. And it just appeared as though the elephant had disappeared. It never did. It was one of the best illusions that we were able to come up with. And it took many, many years for people to figure out how we did it. What stunt did you enjoy the most? I think the one I enjoyed the most was my milk can stunt. It looked like it was very, very difficult to do. But in reality, it was very simple. I would escape from the milk, milk can. The people would be amazed. And I would say, that's an easy way to make a living. <laughs> Did you design your own acts or illusions? I, I did. My wife would help me. My brother would help me. Now, keep in mind, my brother was also very talented. He was an escape artist and a magician as well. So we would work together on many of the, of the stunts, and many of the stunts he could do as well. My wife was very intelligent. She had a very keen eye for things. Once you truly study the, the art of magic, you will understand that there are certain things that, that control. There are certain illusions that are very effective with people. Individuals are very easily distracted. And the art of distraction and illusion is what makes much of it possible. Today, people like Copperfield have taken it to just an incredible extreme of what they can do. Keep in mind, when I did it, I didn't. I was pretty much a pioneer. I didn't have the use of a lot of the technologies that the modern guys have. I often wonder what I could accomplish today with the modern tools, but we'll never know. I have another question from one of our listeners. Who do you socialize with now that you're in heaven? I socialize with many great people. I'm blessed to be in an upper level here, so I have a lot of choices on who I speak with. A lot of people, a lot of famous people, come to me to, to get to know me. I see people like, would you believe Einstein? He, would you believe he often asked me how I did some of the stunts? <laughs> but I really have my choice here. I have, I talk to presidents. I talk to kings. I spend most of my time with my wife, but we really do have a wonderful time talking to the other spirit energies that are here. That's great. Who introduced you to spiritualism? Spiritualism grew very rapidly in the time that I was living. 
Conan Doyle was a great spiritualist. He and I would debate it for hours on end. He introduced me to a lot of things that were involved with spiritualism, many of which I disagreed with. I actually disagreed him to the time that uh, we were no longer friends, but I was sad about that. But I do see him on this side. Dole and I are good friends on this side. But he did a lot to introduce me to the concepts of spiritualism. Why were you so opposed? I just realized there were so many fakes. I was, I was very good at my trade. I could look at stunts and understand when they were a stunt. Just the same as there's no way that Barry could be speaking all these things and all the words that I'm, I'm answering tonight. There was no way many of these people could be doing the stunts that they were doing. It could not be real. They were truly taking advantage of people, and it irritated me greatly. What was your opinion about physical pain? I always thought that you could, that pain was basically mind over matter. Pain can be reduced mentally. I had a knack to do that. Many times I would perform even with broken bones and I could overcome pain. I found out the hard way that sometimes you should listen to pain because it could be something very seriously that you're not going to control with your mind. In my business, I would hurt myself. I would cause myself much pain. If I couldn't control it, there were times that I would not have been able to perform. So my threshold was very high. I could have I could perform with pain that would put most people in bed. Would you say that this opinion helped lead to your death? Yes, that's what I was hinting at. <laughs> On October twenty second, nineteen twenty six, you allowed McGill University student Gordon Whitehead to punch you in the stomach in your dressing room while preparing for an appearance in Montreal, Canada. Will you tell us what happened that night? He came in with a newspaper girl that wanted to do some sketches. I had, I was generally pretty busy and not able to see a lot of people in private like that. I always prided myself on being in great physical condition and being able to take a lot of pain. He asked me if, if I thought that I could, that, he could hit me in the stomach and it would not bother me. I said that, that he probably could and he immediately hit me in the stomach and I was not as prepared as I wanted to be. He struck me a second time and I told him to stop. I don't know, I truly don't want, didn't understand what he was trying to do, but I had not prepared my muscles satisfactorily for for such a blow, and he was a very strong man. I suffered pain from being struck. Now, sadly, it apparently coincided with the pain from me having appendicitis. I don't truly think that him hitting me in that area had anything to do with the appendix, but I did have ongoing pain from it, and I did not realize that I had a very serious problem with my appendix, which eventually burst, and the poison from that is what killed me. Did you have any symptoms of the appendicitis before he hit you? I'd been fe actually been feeling some light pain in the area, but I was so used to it, I thought that it was just indigestion or perhaps a problem with my bowels. Yes, I did have some discomfort, but it was not that great. So that's why you didn't go see a doctor at that point? 
I always tried to avoid seeing doctors whenever I could. They would never, their advice was always something that I would not have time for. They would tell me to take off time and, and let something heal. And I would say, but I have, to, I have a performance tonight that I have to do. I truly believed in the concept that the show had to go on. So did the hit in the stomach affect your death? I mean, did it bring it on faster? Only, only by me ignoring the pain. I thought that the pain from the appendix was from the, from the punch that I'd taken in the stomach. Okay, there is a theory out there that you were poisoned, so I take it that that's not true, that you were poisoned from the appendicitis. I was poisoned, yes, from appendicitis. That was it. No, there were many rumors. Uh, there were many rumors that about Whitehead doing what he did. That some said that he he was paid to to, to try to to hurt me. It was it was a stupid thing. I should have never allowed him to do it, but that that is the way of things. So was your death premature, or was it your time? Because you know, we all come back with the time. Yes, Connie, as you know, we all come back with a time of, of passing. And when I returned, I found out that it was my time. Okay. The Houdini Museum in Scranton, Pennsylvania, has done much to preserve your memory. They advertised an original Houdini seance. What would your message be to the museum? I do appreciate all that the museum has done through the years to preserve my heritage, to preserve my acts, and to have people continue to want to learn about me. The seance thing, I never believed in seance, as you know. I attacked individuals that were doing fake seances. A seance is basically crap. I'm sorry to use the word, but whenever somebody wants to do a seance with you, you should probably think that maybe I should, maybe that's not too accurate. True psychic abilities are not something that requires a lot of stage for instance, Barry can just sit and speak the words. Other good psychics can do things. They hear things in their head. They know. They can do readings for people. But for a group of people to sit in a room and hold their hands over the table and look for energies, it's, it's just not something I think it does justice to what the museum is trying to do. Will you ever communicate with the Houdini Museum? I have been there when they're doing their seance and trying to contact me. I have never had anybody on on the human side that was able to speak my words, so I did not try. I didn't try to bring any type of energy to them that they would feel. I always thought that seance was to be avoided and I did not want to change that opinion once I was on the other side. So then you're not in favor of the annual seance? I don't think it does justice to the great work that they do. Okay. David Copperfield is probably the most successful professional illusionist, which you said you like him best. Uh, would, would you have anything else to say about him? You did speak of him earlier. I know that David has purchased much of my much of my items that I used in my act. I know that he has, has studied a lot of what did I a lot of the things that I did. I know that David has expanded the world of magic so that many many people can enjoy it and be amazed by it. What David has done with his life is a is a great tribute to the professionalism 
of, of what true illusionists can do. David has never said that he does this through, through paranormal abilities or through spiritualism or any other type of form of supernatural assistance. When you go to see a show by David, you know that you're going to see the best. You know that he has perfected his trade beyond basically what anyone else has been able to do. There were other acts. Uh, there are other really, really talented magicians out there. I hope that the magicians that are having the opportunity to make so much money today are using their profession to the best of their ability. Magic should remain magic. It should be something that people are amazed by. The great technologies that they have access today can set up situations where individuals are astonished by what they see. Sometimes I wish that I was here with them. Do you have any advice for him? Just keep doing what he's doing for as long as he can do it. Great. I have another question from a listener. Do you still plan or think up great illusions? I do. I watch from this side, and I try to in actually influence some of the, of the, of the great people. I wish, I do truly wish that I had was able to utilize these new technologies. Of course, I was so old school, I was so busy trying to kill myself and astonish people with physical action. Finesse is the wonderful thing that they use today. Do you plan to reincarnate? I'm thinking about it. I don't know what I would truly come back as. As you know, we have to follow life plans and there's things that we have to learn. I came back as an entertainer. I think that life plan was very successful and I don't think I have to do it again. But yes, there will be a time that I return. I will discuss with my guides what they want me to do and I will hopefully do the best to live up to that plan. But for now, I'm actually quite quite happy here with my wife. I can understand that. Uh, so thank you so much, Harry, for joining us this evening. Uh, do you have a final message for us? Yes. Once again, I want to thank you for allowing me to, shall we say, perform for the people. The hard thing when you're on this side is having people hear your words. It is truly difficult to get your messages that individuals living a human life can understand. In many ways, we're not supposed to communicate, but in many ways, we do try to influence. We understand what life plans are for some people, and we try to help them. It is very discouraging when you try to help an individual and they do not understand that we're trying to help them. There are many people out there that will take advantage of others. That was why I attacked many of the spiritualists, because they were just simply crooks. Use your common sense. Pay attention to the words these people speak. Pay attention to the deeds that they do. If they're trying to gain a lot of money from what they're doing, I would walk away from them. Greed influences many people. Many people use magical tricks to steal from others. Many people have have no sense of decency. 
I always tried to display a sense of decency in everything that I did, and when I returned, I was fairly judged. People need to understand that honesty is the best policy. Be honest with others. I know you hear many good messages. I know that there are many opportunities for you to take advantage of others. Don't do it. Just use your common sense. Be kind. Show love. And go see a good mag magician once in a while. It'll be good for your soul. Goodbye and thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. That turned out to be every bit as interesting as I would, knew it was going to be. Word about next week. I hope it works. We're going to try to do a roundtable discussion with Keynes, Schweitzer, and Bishop Sheen. Those are three wonderful personalities. We're going to let them carry on the discussion, so there probably won't be a lot of questions asked next week. If, if it doesn't work, there may be, we may need a lot of questions, so tune in. It's going to be very interesting. You can generally submit questions to us on our email, channelinghistoryonparax at gmail.com. I'm always looking for good suggestions for shows. I, I do actually read the emails and try to do what people would like to hear. My seventh book, Spirit Speak, Channeling Jesus and the Holy Spirit, is available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and wherever books are sold. It's on Kindle for immediate download. Signed copies are only available on my website, spiritspeak.com, or wordsofgodthenandnow.com. We will be having a new book coming out in a couple months. It will have all the messages of Jesus that we channeled on our Wednesday morning shows. It's going to be very interesting. I hope that uh, you will take time to buy it and read it. So, thank you very much for listening. We enjoy coming to you on these Sunday nights. We hope that we are helping educate you. And sometimes I hope that we're helping to entertain you. Next week's going to be a very serious discussion. I hope you join us. So thank you for listening. Please join us Sundays at 9 p.m. Eastern Time on the Parax Radio Network. And I would also like to thank you all for tuning in this evening. You all have a wonderful week, and God bless you all. Thanks for listening to Channeling History. Tune in again next week for another electrifying episode as we never know who will make an appearance or who will come through the portal. Any rebroadcast or other use of this program without explicit permission is strictly prohibited. Copyright 2020. Our story begins by Kevin McLeod, licensed through Incompetech.com.